Hello and welcome to Threaded Together, a podcast that stitches together home sewing and high fashion. We're your hosts. I'm Tracy. I'm Rebecca. And in today's episode, we'll be discussing Pattern Drafting 101. This is our third episode for Threaded Together, and we are so excited to have you. And we're thrilled to have you back listening to us again. And don't forget to find us on social media at Threaded Together Podcast, where you can see what we're working on and keep up with us between podcasts. Just give us a follow. Pattern drafting can be an intimidating topic as it's an entire field of expertise in the garment making world. Pattern making is also one of the first things that home sewers put on their list of things to learn because it can unlock an entirely new world of possibilities for creating garments. Today's episode is going to be rooted in why you might want to learn to make a pattern. Perhaps you want to learn how to make a pattern in order to change an existing garment or to make something new that you can't find a pattern for. You might want to learn how to start translating something you see in fashion on a runway into an idea of a pattern piece that you might want to replicate or to simply open a new door of creative potential for yourself. If any of those objectives are something that you've thought about, this is going to be the episode for you. In today's episode, we will share our favorite resources for getting started with pattern cutting, different approaches to getting started, and how to apply those basics in the context of adapting patterns, which can be a great time to start experimenting with how to draft your own patterns. So in the past, we've spoken about London Fashion Week, but we haven't really covered pop culture and high fashion very much up to this point. But a certain event is approaching that is perhaps one of the most visible moments of high fashion for the year, in my opinion. Oh, yes. The Met Gala. Exactly. The Met Gala. In case you've not heard of the Met Gala, it is a once annual charity gala for the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York that has become quite the pop culture phenomenon as the guest list is small, but the fashion is out of this world. Every year, the Met Choose is a theme, and this year is a fashion lover's dream. As a tribute to the late Karl Lagerfeld, former designer for Chloe, Bendy, and of course, most famously, Chanel. In homage to Carl's legacy, Anna Winter, the editor-in-chief of American Vogue, commissioned different designers to create garments in tribute to the late designer, and then publish a behind-the-scenes video of their creation and the meaning behind them. And wow, Tracy, I know I sent it to you the moment I saw it. What did you think? It's incredible. I love behind-the-scenes videos, and it's just an absolute feast for the eyes. It was so amazing. Did you have a favorite? I've been dying to ask. Yes, I loved the Christopher John Rogers Fendi inspired pink organza dress. (laughs) The structure on it was incredible. And we've over like 250 pieces of organza and an underskirt and a bone corset. It was just beautiful. And what about you? I'm betting I can guess. (laughs) <laughs> well, I was going to say with the silk organza, I'm not surprised with your <laughs> choice. Um, mine, of course, was the Tom Brown outfit. It was yeah. everything my dreams were made of. He created that tweed suit, partially deconstructed, and on top had a portion of a lapel from a Chanel coat blown up to be the size of a cape with a mm. train. It absolutely took my breath away. Everything I love, drama, a lot of wadding <laughs> to make mm-hmm. it puffy. Um, and it reminded me of actually the sets that Lagerfeld used to do, used to create for the Chanel shows, including including I remember one year there was a giant like several stories high actually Chanel jacket that was the centerpiece of this show that was so incredible so it reminded me of that oh wow that's amazing it was just all of the pieces were incredible but yeah they're so so fabulous we absolutely recommend watching the video it's great to see the behind the scenes um and even in the Valentino piece I love seeing the understructure of the jacket in the making of video. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was really phenomenal. So definitely something fun to watch if you are looking for some behind the scenes construction. Yeah, it was superb. A great video. And we will definitely be watching the fun come the first Monday in May. We will. And now back to our regularly scheduled programming. We are really excited to talk about pattern cutting in today's episode. But before we get into that, Tracy, it is time for what have you been working on in the last month? Well, I've had lots of sewing time, which has been wonderful. 
Um, I love a bank holiday for catching up on sewing time. Mm. I finished my organza blouse, which is excellent, but very, very pink. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I wore it at a recent family gathering. And my brother-in-law said, your shirt is very aggressive. <laughs> I mean, it is quite bold. <laughs> I imagine that he meant bold and impactful, but maybe struggled a bit. For work choice, perhaps. <laughs> but I love that you made such a statement. It's I've seen photos. It's absolutely gorgeous. Thank you. Um, I also finished my fiber mood Clio, um, which is super and it's a really lovely pattern to do to make up. I made it in denim and I opted for snap fasteners on the back instead of buttons, as I thought denim buttons would dig in when you sit back um mm. it's quite short which is the design but i'm five nine and so i think if i make it again i'll add a little bit more length to it because i don't quite wear mini skirts like i used to um but it's it's really cool I'm really happy with it you are quite tall tracy so <laughs> is is that a challenge with a lot of the patterns like how how short are we talking is this a tunic that's not a tunic. It's it covers the <laughs> it covers the bum, but you know okay. only only just <laughs> definitely is one to wear with tights. Mm. Gotcha. Um, but it's it's cool and it's like a, I really like the style. But yeah, I'll probably add a little inch um, next time. I also subscribe to the Fabric Godmother Dream Wardrobe, which is like a monthly subscription, and they give you a pattern and some fabric each month. And the March box was the Heather Blazer from Friday Pattern Company, and some beautiful Fabric Godmother linen. And um, yeah, this blazer has been on my to make list for a long time because um, it's an unstructured blazer with a slightly oversized fit. And um, it's made using like just interfacing, so knit and woven interfacing. There's no pad stitching or anything like that. <laughs> I was going to ask, any pad stitching? <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and it's a really like, fun floral linen. So it's been really lovely to make. I haven't quite finished it. Just got to put my button on and finish the lining. But it's, um, it's, it's a really lovely jacket for spring. Oh, that sounds like such a fun one. Um, you know what I'm going to say. We want all the photos of all of the things. But I'm, I'm excited to see that blazer because I think you'll be the first completed blazer in the group since the session last summer. <laughs> I'm so inspired by how much you were able to get done. That's absolutely amazing. Um, let's see. In the past month, I've really only worked on two things, but they do have some relevance to this episode, I think. Uh, the mm -hmm. first is a jacket that I designed and drafted the pattern for in 2D, modifying a block from the Fashion Pattern Making Techniques book that we'll talk about mm -hmm. in a little bit by yep. Antonio Donano. Um, and when I say modify, you've seen photos, Tracy, I completely went off the deep end. Mm -hmm. And what was once a seven piece pattern became 11 pieces with pokey shoulder bits. It's quite something. <laughs> <laughs> I've well, seen photos, it's spectacular. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. This is one of the few things I made a twall of the pattern since it was something I was drafting pretty much from scratch. Um, and by twall, again, we made a draft in an easy to work with wool fabric in the winter. So I made that twall last winter. And then this past month, I finally made the body of the jacket in a double layered red silk organza. So very relevant, jumped right in after our last episode. I just could not resist seeing mm -hmm. all of your gorgeous pink silk organza sewing tracy um and it came together really nicely i still have a few more tweaks to make on the jacket before it's finished and i can share it when it's done but lots of careful sewing on that one french seams don't really like to sit on curves i have noticed mm, certainly tricky and for the second project, I tried to go pattern free to upcycle a vintage sleeping bag into a statement jacket coat thing. And you may have seen on Instagram, I saw a series of photos of an Issey Miyake jacket and naively thought it was just a rectangle of fabric with holes for sleeves. So I cut holes in the fabric for arms, trim the length, use the spare fabric for the sleeves and voila. Except it turns out, as you well know, Tracy, that that jacket was 
is not in fact just a rectangle. So mm-hmm. you and I took a deep dive into some images of vintage patterns and figured out that the back was tapered inwards. And in hindsight, I also noticed the armholes were also slanted for shaping. So to modify, I took in the back, added a zipper and some buttons, and it's a pretty decent piece. And Tracy, I have to ask, though, because you were quite the 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 great sounding board on that project. What were your thoughts when I first came to you and said, oh, it's just a rectangle? Because I don't think you thought it was as simple as I initially did. <laughs> well, I mean, it is a rectangle. It just, <laughs> just needed a little tweak. I always appreciate the fact that you'll just leap head first into a project. It's um, it's admirable. <laughs> I think I think you got there in the end. And that's all that matters, right? It's all a journey. Yes. And I really appreciated your support on that one because regardless, it was a fun project to show that you don't need a formal pattern to make a garment, but you do need some techniques. So that I think is a good segue into Pattern Drafting 101, the topic of this episode. This episode is intended to be a whisk stop tour of resources and ideas for getting started with pattern cutting. We are going to focus on flat pattern cutting or 2D pattern cutting. I've attended a few terms of evening classes at Morley College, a mixture of beginner classes through to intermediate slash advanced. And we've spoken about this before, but I love in-person classes. Um, As well as the expertise from the tutor, you also get to learn and discuss ideas with other students. And Rebecca? You also have some experience of pattern cutting. I have a lot of, let's call it self-taught experience with pattern cutting. I started tracing garments for patterns, draping and just free drying patterns initially and quickly learned a lot of things as I think is the way I tend to do things the hard way. (laughs) Um, I love to learn new things though. So I've upskilled quite a bit simply through reading and applying techniques through trial and error. And of course, I'm very fortunate to have you, Tracy, as a sounding board to bounce ideas off of and to provide some guidance when I get in over my head when it comes to making my own patterns. Mm -hmm. But I I do hope that having a less traditional background in this field will help me to share some learning pathways that might be more accessible to anybody who can't have access to kind of that more uh, formal pathway or who who struggles a little bit in that more structured setting to help you get started easily with pattern making um, because it's a lot of fun. Yes. And we have a lot of exciting things to share today, Tracy, and I consider you an expert on pattern making. So what would you say your level of expertise is and what are your favorite methods for making a pattern? (laughs) I'm definitely not an expert. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I really enjoy pattern drafting. And since I've started doing it, I always look at garments in a different way to see Mm. how it could be possibly made up last summer I walked past a shop window and they had this really cool dress and I thought to myself I could totally make that and so within a couple of days I'd made a pattern worked my way through a couple of twirls ordered my fabric made the dress up but often what I want to make is a variation on what I already have in my pattern stash um there's so many fabulous indie pattern companies out there and they always have interesting techniques and designs. And so I must confess that I normally take the slightly easier route and take a pattern that I already have and use that as a basis to um, Mm -hmm. adjust to make what I want to make. Um, So be that like extra layers or different sleeves or a different neckline. But all the classes that I've taken in pattern cutting have have really... um, given me the confidence to do that and to do it well. And what about you? The same question. What (laughs) level do you think you are and what your methods? Well, I would say compared to me, Tracy, you're absolutely an expert. I would say your grasp of pattern drafting and modifications is is quite stellar. Um, By contrast, I would say I'm maybe an intermediate level of expertise as I can draft and make modifications to patterns fairly easily, but I am no means a master. I think a, a great example is you and I were chatting about a modification in our our WhatsApp and I was trying to explain it and then you recorded a video of how to change the dart and I was like yeah that's that's what I meant but I looked back at what I wrote and the video made a lot more sense this is where 
you can see the clear delineation there. I'm a much more visual person. I tend to do a lot of the pattern making in kind of a, a 3D image of what I'm trying to do in my head. That makes it easier for me to actually create the garment first and then translate it into a pattern directly versus doing the other thing, which is starting with kind of that flat pattern and then building it into the shape that I'm trying to get to. I've successfully started in 2D that one time with that jacket with those large 3D shoulders. But the process was very labor intensive and a lot of staring at the piece of paper and trying to like twist it in my head to figure out what the shape was going to be. Um, so definitely starting in 3D is my preference. And Tracy, we keep using the terms pattern cutting and pattern drafting interchangeably. Can you share a quick definition for anyone who's brand new to the topic on what we might mean there? I would love to. So let's start with pattern making. It means as you would expect. It's a catch-all for any method of making a pattern. Pattern drafting means you're drafting the pattern in a flat 2D shape to a set of measurements. This is also flat patterning. And where we are going to start today, pattern cutting is another term for making a pattern, creating basic patterns with specific measurements. Do you know, when I tell some of my work colleagues that I'm doing I've been doing pattern cutting <laughs> classes. They're like, all right, what? So you just cut out a pattern then? <laughs> <laughs> what do you do for the rest of the time? <laughs> you just sit and chat. <laughs> to get an overall feel for pattern making, we're going to start with how it's done in high fashion, since there are two strategies for approaching pattern making that designers generally take. And that may help you choose which route suits your sewing personality and interest. Best. In high fashion, there is often a distinction and separation between the designer and the pattern maker and the techniques through which the patterns are made. At home, we may make a pattern to make the first garment or twelve, but in the high fashion world, there are two ways of doing that. The first way is draping in its various forms where the garment is constructed before the pattern is made, either on a dress form or a body, and then the pattern is made from that prototype to replicate the shape. The most famous example of this would be Madame Viennet. Holston was a good example of this, but his technique was modelled after Viennet. Alexander McQueen was well documented draping his patterns and even constructing tailored pieces without having a pattern handy. The second way is from a sketch and crafting the pattern flat on a piece of paper and then cutting the pieces constructing it out of fabric and turning it into a 3D shape. In these instances, you see a lot more emphasis on the role of the pattern maker in the creative process. Some of the most famous people who use this process are Ray Kawakubo from Comme des Garcons. Karl Lagerfeld, formerly of Chanel, did a lot of sketches that then were interpreted by his ateliers into garments. Most modern designers use this technique since the way garment design is taught in schools is often fairly siloed these days. If you want to learn how to make a pattern or a garment faster and be able to get more creative with your approach, I would recommend starting with the first technique to get a grasp of shape and pattern and then moving on to the second. One of the assumptions is that in order to be able to communicate via a sketch in a flat pattern modification, you must first have an understanding of what the garment looks like in 3D space. Learning the first part will make a 2D representation or visualization significantly easier in my opinion. What do you think, Tracy? I think that's the beauty of this. There's so many different ways to get to an end result. And it really depends on how your brain works, how you visualize things and how you like working. That's such a great point. And there's actually a great modern day example of the success of both of these techniques in the creative director duo behind Oscar de la Renta, Laura Kim and Fernando Garcia. They're also the founders of the label Monse, known for its deconstructionist take on more traditional clothing. One half of the design duo, Laura Kim, almost exclusively drapes her designs while Fernando Garcia sketches his ideas and then a pattern maker converts them into a toile. I watched mm -hmm. a masterclass recently that follows their design journey and seeing the different techniques used side by side highlighted how neither technique is superior in the high fashion world. That's so interesting. It was really cool to see. So when we think of passions, we usually think of a flat piece of paper cut into the shape of a garment. And when we think of commercially available patterns, that's usually what comes to mind. So today we're going to start with flat pattern cutting, which begins with a block. A block, also known as a sloper, is a basic pattern shape that is used to create patterns. They're all created without seam allowances, 
as it's easier to manipulate and draw from a block without seam allowances. Before sewing up a twirl, you will need to add the seam allowances on. For any sewing newbies, a twirl is like a prototype of the garment where you make the garment in a fabric that isn't your final fabric in order to test the integrity of your pattern and to find out if there might be fit issues and to correct them before you cut your final garment. This is an important step to see if 2D pattern fits in three dimensions the way you want it to. If you think about all the curves in the body, you need a flat pattern that when sewn up together can fit those curves. It has to be flat for you to be able to work with it properly, to be able to manipulate the pattern piece and to be able to cut the pattern piece out of your fabric, which is two-dimensional. You really have to take the 3D body and make it 2D. Yes, Tracy, taking a three-dimensional human body and representing it in two dimensions on a flat piece of paper is the essence of flat pattern making. There are a lot of different kinds of blocks or flat representations of garment pieces, but the basics for women's dressmaking are the bodice block, the skirt block, the sleeve block, and a trouser block. And a good starting point is the bodice block. The bodice block is the top half of the body made up of a front and back piece with a shaped neckline that extends from the front to the back of the body with room for armholes on either side. A basic bodice block has two darts in the front or places where a piece of the pattern is removed and the pattern is rejoined without that space, which creates a three-dimensional protrusion on the block once constructed that allows for the shape of the body in this case, the bust. The bodice block also has two darts on the back that are less extreme than on the front. When you sew up the darts on the pattern, it makes the pattern piece 3D, which allows the garment to follow the curve of the back. Flat pattern making can be challenging to explain without visuals, but I think you just nailed it, Tracy. We will, of course, add reference images in the show notes in case you would like visuals to follow along with as well. Our next block that we're going to talk about is a skirt block, and it is made up of a front and a back piece. The skirt block also has to create room in the garment for your hips and your derriere or rear end. One of the best descriptions I ever read about how darts work is that you take away a bit of the pattern in the form of a triangle that is cut out and then closed. And then you redistribute that space to wherever the end point of the dart is. In the case of a skirt block, the darts are the widest at the waist and then taper downward, allowing the skirt to come in at your waist and then add fullness where you need it around your hips and butt. Mm -hmm. It may seem counterintuitive, but making a dart gives the body more space in the garment and removing the dart will actually take away volume in the garment, assuming it's placed correctly. A side note, Tracy, this is one of my biggest pet peeves in sewing shows when somebody cuts a garment too tight on a model and then the contestants remove the darts to give more <laughs> space. It gives you more fabric, but it's never really where you need it. Now, Tracy, sleeve blocks were one of those things that when I was getting started, I couldn't just drape or guess the shape of. Seeing mm -hmm. a sleeve flat in 2D in a block was a total aha moment for me. Yeah, I agree. When I first started sewing, the sleeve was like the hardest thing to get my head around. The difference mm -hmm. between the front and the back, it's just a, a confusing shape and not what you'd expect mm -hmm. at all. So a sleeve block is composed of two parts that are shaped differently for different purposes. You've got the top of the block, which is a curved sleeve head that fits into the armhole. And then the block extends into the shape of the sleeve itself. The center of the sleeve head is traditionally a curve at the top that accommodates the top of the arm and that slopes on either side into a concave with a deeper curve at the underarm. You may see a shallower curve on the back of the sleeve as more fabric is required to allow the arm to move forward. Very simply, a sleeve head looks like a hill with valleys on either side and the depth of the valleys and their evenness control the movement of the arm where the sleeve attaches to the body. So once you have the sleeve head, the sleeve extension of the block can be a number of different shapes, but it will always need to be a sufficient width to cover the bicep and forearm before tapering down to the wrist. And you can vary the sleeve blocks to have more or less sleeve headies, higher or lower crowns, depending on the garment that's been made. So for example, a tailored sleeve will have no ease and a high crown compared to the ease in the sleeve and the low crown of a loosely fitted t-shirt. 
There are also blocks for trousers and jackets, but for today, we'll stick with the basic blocks of a bodice, sleeve, and skirt, as the concepts are the same as those used in the other block pieces. And you can find pre-made blocks out there in the world. A pattern cutter or company can have a selection of blocks for different sizes to choose from. But at home, if you are just making patterns for yourself, you only need blocks for the size suited to you. Block making for your own body can seem like a lot of math and geometry when you're first getting started. And I'm speaking from experience here. But luckily for you, we've already struggled through it and settled on what we think are some of the best resources to make it simple, easy, and dare I say, a fun process to make your Mm -hmm. own custom pattern block. To make your own block at home. We recommend working from a book, which steps you through making your block from your measurements. Rebecca often calls this painting by numbers, only pattern making. (laughs) (laughs) Once you've created your first draft, you'll need to tweak it. It's helpful to have a sewing friend to identify where you can adjust it. But failing that, lots of photos will help you work out what needs tweaking and how to improve the fit. It might take several twirls to get a good fitting block, but it's part of the process that is worth it in the long run. There are some excellent books that have some really clear guides on creating your own blocks. So some of the books that have really clear guides on creating your own blocks are Pattern Cutting, Metric Pattern Cutting for Women's Wear, Pattern Making for Fashion Design, and we'll link all of those in the show notes. There's also some great online tutorials. And one of the the ones we were amazed by when we were researching this was The Shapes of Fabric, which is a really Mm. comprehensive tutorial. Since I do not have any formal experience in pattern drafting, I found it a bit intimidating to start with basic blocks and instead found it easier to start with blocks made for specific garments. Luckily, there is a book series for that. My favorite resource being the Fashion Pattern Making Technique books by Antonio Donato. Alternatively, don't forget to have a look at local sewing classes and adult learning colleges near you. There are always places that offer courses to make your own block. There are also a lot of YouTube tutorials as well for getting started making a block. But again, having someone to talk to while you're going through that process is invaluable. Luckily, I, of course, had Tracy as a brilliant resource. I made my bodice skirt and sleeve block a few years ago at Sew It With Love in London. And I've also made a trouser block and I did that at Morley College. That was a couple of years ago. They're really useful to have and to have the expertise of someone when you're making them up. So to get started with pattern cutting, we are going to share the basic things that you need as you will use them in all of the pattern hacking methodologies that we are about to share. Though there is dot and cross paper, I much prefer using plain paper. You want paper that is plain white and slightly transparent so that you can trace through it. You want to get pattern paper on as big of rolls as possible because you will go through a lot of paper while Mm -hmm. making a pattern. I find that art paper is a great resource for this that is easy to find and comes on rolls. You can roll it out just like your fabric. Next up is the Pattern Master. This is a specifically designed tool for pattern designing. They are perspex with a straight ruler at the bottom and a curved edge on the top. The curved edge can be used to get the correct shape for curves on your pattern, like the neck hole or the armhole or the hip. And the straight edge has many rows of measurements, so you can quickly and accurately add pleats, hems, seam allowances. The ruler on the long straight edge starts at zero in the middle and goes out to 20 centimetres in both directions. And this makes it really easy to find a center point of two lines or to mark the same distance either side of a line. Now, Tracy, a quick note on the Pattern Master. I didn't know what this was until we went to our tailoring course last summer. And I have to say it absolutely changed my life. I had every Mm -hmm. other drafting ruler on the planet, but this one combines them all. And I can't imagine tracing a pattern anymore without it, especially with all of the curves and the seam allowance uh, measurements that make your life so easy. I'll share a resource on it in the show notes in case you're like me and didn't know that the Pattern Master was what you had been missing all of your life. They are brilliant, truly brilliant. Up next, we have two kinds of tape. The first is a measuring tape and you want a metal tip tape that's plastic or linen so that you can use it on its edge as well to to measure lines. I like a nice double-sided tape so that I can use it in either direction, but obviously it's personal preference. 
And the second kind of tape is adhesive tape. You need Mm -hmm. lots of tape to stick paper together as you slash and spread and manipulate your pattern pieces. Tracy, do you have a specific kind of tape you like to use? Yes, I like using masking tape, also known as painter's tape, because it's cheap. You can write on it and it's easy enough to remove if you make a mistake. That's brilliant. I need to step up my tape game as I just use packing tape since I (laughs) always have some on hand. That's a good example, though, that you don't always need fancy tools to get started. Just use what you have on hand. Initially, I used to tape together printer paper until I realized it was more efficient to use bigger rolls of paper. So use what you have. And when you're ready, you can use us or Tracy in this case as a resource (laughs) for how to be more professional in your pattern making. Next up, we have pencils. Mechanical pencil will help you always get a nice sharp line. Colored pencils or fine liner pens are also helpful for marking up pattern changes and pattern information. And then a tracing wheel, which can be used to trace a line onto another piece of paper. Now, Tracy, I didn't know what a tracing wheel is. Would you mind enlightening all of us, please? Sure. So a tracing wheel looks a little like a pastry wheel, but it's not. It's definitely not. (laughs) It has a long handle and a rotating wheel that's either serrated or a flat wheel, though the serrated one is more common. And you can use it to trace your pattern onto a fresh sheet of paper underneath the pattern by running the wheel along the lines you want to trace. And as you apply pressure, it will leave perforations on the paper underneath. And it's really helpful for facings and darts and hems as well. Oh, yes. And I remember you telling me about this in the past. And there was a mention of wax paper or something like that as well. You can get waxed carbon tracing paper, which you place between the pattern and the back of the fabric. And you trace your pattern markings using your wheel through to the fabric um or you could also onto a onto paper as well mm. i've never had much success with this i found it a bit fiddly i also like a bit more control about the placement of my pattern pieces um which i think is a bit harder when there's tracing paper in the way as well that sounds like a lot of layers so that yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of other tools you'll obviously need decent scissors and pins and fabrics to twirl or they're all things you should already have in your sewing arsenal. Mm. Next, we're going to talk through key terms you will want to learn when pattern making. There are quite a few, so we will also include a key term glossary linked to the show notes so you can reread and refer to for future use. So let's talk about some of the key terms that you'll come across when pattern cutting. Probably the most important is the grain line. How you lay your pattern along the grain line of the fabric will affect the appearance of the garment and how it hangs. It is a really important marker to have on every pattern piece. Next up, truing. To make sure that things match up. You need to make sure that your seams are the same length, that your dark legs are the same length, that lines meet up smoothly and unless intended otherwise at right angles. To true your block or pattern pieces, you want to ensure that the center front line that intersects with the waistline is at a right angle. Similarly, you want your waist to your side and the underarm to the side, the top of the shoulder to your armhole, all of those to be at right angles. You'll notice that at the intersection of a curved line, it is at a complete right angle to its adjoining line. You also want to check that pieces that will be sewn together match up. So for example, the side on your front and the side on your back should line up. You can do this by measuring the pieces. And this is where accuracy matters. Every millimeter counts. For curved areas, you can put your tape measure on its side to measure. Or alternatively, you can walk the pattern pieces, which is where you just kind of line them up against each other (laughs) and walk them along. (laughs) Make sure you consider intended ease when checking lengths. For example, a sleeve to an armhole. Ooh, that's that's a really good point, Tracy, because we did that a lot with our jacket making. Yeah, absolutely. So to true darts, you want to fold the paper along the dart stitching line and fold it down if it's on a side or to the center front back if it's along the waist and then cut along that line. And that gives you a nice true seam line. Other terms we'll come across are uh, balance lines. This is where you mark the horizontal balance lines on the garment. So for example, the waist and the hip that represent the crosswise grain and help align pattern pieces. Balance points are similarly used throughout the pattern to help 
adjoin pieces, for example, a notch on the side back to align with the dart on the side front. Blending. This is the phrase given to making a smooth curve out of angular lines for a smooth transition from one point to another. Dart manipulation is taking a dart that already exists and manipulating it to a different location. This could be to move it, to eliminate it, split it into multiple darts or making it into tucks, pleats, flares, or gathers to change the shape. So if you wanted to move a dart, you can do that using the slash and spread method. So for example, to move the side bus dart to the waist, you would want to mark where you want your dart to be on the waist and then draw a line from the waist to the bus point and cut along your original dart, along one of the dart legs to just shy of the bus part. That is cutting to, but not through the bus point. And you do the same with your new dart line, cut along it, but not through the bus point. Then close your original dart and voila, the new space is your new dart. Put a bit of paper underneath it and then true the dart, mark your new dart legs. <laughs> to move a dart using the pivot method, it's the same concept as slash and spread, but without any tape, cutting or extra bits of paper. On your block, mark where you want the new dart to be and then take your block and draw round from the end of one dart leg of your original dart to where you want your new dart to be. Then using a pencil or pin on the bus point, pivot to close your original dart, draw from your old closed dart to where on the block you've marked your new dart, and then there you have it. The opening is your new dart. This, to me, Tracy, looks a lot like kind of like spinning a pinwheel, but with yeah, with a, a block. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and again, you did the most beautiful video of this, and I'm going to make sure we <laughs> upload that. So that everyone it, was, it was a really rough no it was fantastic <laughs> I was like did you find this on the internet or do you just do this on the fly it was so good I was immediately like download to post later <laughs> you can eliminate darts completely by closing them and moving the flare into another part of the garment so for example an A-line skirt can be achieved by closing the dart Winifred Aldrich has some great instructions on this as does dress pattern making which we'll link in the show notes. You can also eliminate darts by making them into style lines. If you think about a princess seam, the curved shape of the bodice is made by joining up two darts from the waist through to the arm or the shoulder. The Shapes of Fabrics website has some great visuals on this. And this is actually a technique I love to use doing a princess seam to create just some really beautiful lines in a bodice instead of doing darts at the top and at the waist. You can split darts into multiple darts or convert darts into pleats or gathers. Oh, the possibilities. We've touched on slash and spread for moving darts, but slash and spread is also a great technique for adding extra fullness or volume to a pattern piece. Draw straight lines equally spaced along your pattern piece, cut or slash along them, and spread them out to make your new piece. Depending on the piece, you may want to cut to, but not through your seam line. For example, a sleeve, you might want to preserve the sleeve head, or you might want to cut all the way through, for example, adding ruffles on a piece you're going to gather. A good example on the sleeve head would be a bishop sleeve, which Tracy happens to be a favorite of mine, <laughs> where you slash and spread at the very top of the sleeve head. And then when you gather it back in on your garment, um, you have this really puffy volume that you've added. And it's great for a lot of drama. Yes, I love a bishop sleeve. Moving on to tracing off garments. You can also do all of these things without buying or making a pattern from scratch. All you need is an example of something that has the feature you're looking for in your closet. You can start with my favorite pattern hack, tracing off existing garments, also known as rubbing off. This is a great methodology for familiarizing yourself with what a pattern piece might look like and give you an ending shape to keep in mind when you begin flat patterning. Tracing a pattern is as simple as that. Try to lay your garment on a flat piece of paper and trace it, noting anything on the pattern that might seem valuable from what we've just described. Pocket placements, joining places, and darts if there are any. You don't need to deconstruct a garment to do this, 
But that is also an option. If you do take apart the garment, don't forget to add seam allowances to the piece you are tracing off. Otherwise, you will lose fabric and distort the shape as you construct the garment. If you do take apart a garment, try to use your seam ripper to keep the fabric pieces in their original shape and note where the seam is and where the seam allowance is on the garment. Again, to retain the shape of the piece once you sew it together. Tracing off of a garment is a great learning exercise, but it also can be kind of imprecise, which means that the upfront pattern piece making is fast, but the fitting and twalling may be slower. So allow for that adjustment in your time planning. And Rebecca, you recently did this with a blouse, if I'm remembering correctly. Mm -hmm. Any any tips from that? Yes, yes, and yes. I deconstructed and traced a blouse that I had had for years, and it it was falling apart. My biggest tip that came out of that would be don't simply trace the garment. Use your pattern master as a guide as you're doing it. That will make tracing the pattern easier if the garment is in good shape to help you see what the curves should be. But it also might save your pattern if it's not in the best of shape. In my case, the blouse I was using was very distorted in shape since it was so old. So I used the pattern master to guess what the curve shape should look like and to recreate straight lines where I thought they should go. Any pattern tracing tips from you, Tracy? That's, I mean, they're brilliant tips. I think that it's best to start with a straight vertical line on your paper to indicate the grain line, then a horizontal line to indicate the hem or waist. And this will really keep you grounded as you trace it off. You can really use the tracing wheel for this to get good curves and measurements from your garment onto paper. And it's really, really important to check measurements. Make sure you have right angles where you need them. This has reminded me though that I've got a coat that I loved so much that I wore it until it was basically threadbare for years with the intention of one day making another one. And I think that now my coat making skills and pattern cutting skills are ready finally to take that project on. So that sounds like a good project to do later in the year. That sounds like a fantastic project, although maybe for the weather is a little cooler. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I'm I'm a big fan of that one. There are so many tips for tracing patterns, but I think that's a good starting point. Don't you, Tracy? Yep, definitely. I was searching my WhatsApp history for trace and it gives me way too many results. So let's leave it at that. Hacking patterns is probably the easiest way to start your journey. With pattern cutting, you can add pockets to a dress that doesn't have them, add extra ruffles to a dress, or make a bigger and grander sleeve. There are also some really great resources out there to draft some simply shaped patterns without needing to use a block at all. So for example, By Hand London have a circle skirt calculator, which helps you calculate the sizes you'd need to make a circle skirt. They also have a really great tutorial on a shirt dress on their Instagram, which is basically just a series of rectangles. Oh, that sounds fantastic. And I I personally love this technique and did something similar when I was starting out using granny squares in crochet, because they're essentially just a lot of squares. Um, And then trying to form them into a shape of a pattern piece was basically just taking squares and making them into rectangles. So very similar. Again, this is a great way to get a feel for how pattern pieces should look in 2D, which is a great way to get introduced into flat pattern making. Up next, we're going to talk about some techniques that can seem more advanced, but can also be great starting points for pattern drafting in more of the 3D space. Tracy, you educated me on one of these, the subtraction cutting piece. And I am so in love with that technique. Yes. I recently took a creative pattern cutting course, um, which I mentioned earlier. And one of the techniques we touched on was subtraction cutting, which is a methodology for experimental pattern cutting by Julian Roberts. And when you think about the traditional pattern cutting, where we take a piece of fabric and cut away the fabric not used by the body, subtraction pattern cutting is the opposite. You remove fabric to create holes that the body will occupy in the garment. From what I've seen, it's also a much less wasteful way of cutting a pattern, but it gives you a lot more fabric to work with on the body. Right, Tracy? Yeah, exactly that. So by only removing the space that the body will occupy within the garment, it dramatically impacts the drape of the fabric around the body. 
to put it simply, you're just cutting holes in tubes of fabric, but the impact is incredibly dramatic. I highly recommend you look at the free cutting guide and watch some of the videos around it. We've linked some of these in the show notes and it's entirely to get a feel of the technique. It's just incredible. I've watched the full YouTube the other weekend on my TV when my husband was out of town and it was so inspiring. I loved the reverse order of the process that was shared because it keeps you guessing as to the shape of the original pattern until the very end. And you'll see what I mean if you watch the video. That strategy helps you to be able to visualize the technique in three dimensions before you see the 2D version, which I think is so powerful with flat pattern making. I used a bit of this technique in the creation of the Issey Miyake inspired jacket that I made, especially for the sleeves, since I just made a tube with whatever fabric I had left with a little bit of a sleeve head and poof, that was the sleeve shape, no pattern necessary. That's the most exciting thing for me about the subtraction technique is you don't need any experience at all in pattern making to experiment with it, but the results will remind you of some of the most cutting edge designers in modern history. Yeah, it's so fab such a brilliant technique so tracy i know we've already covered a high fashion angle but do you mind if i share some of the designers and pieces that i started looking at when i was exploring the subtraction cutting technique (laughs) by all means yes i remember you sent me the isabel toledo dress and that was really exciting yes i feel like visualizing the results of subtraction pattern making is kind of a superpower because suddenly garments that seem like a crazy draped piece make a lot more sense for example, Comme de Garçon and Ray Kawakubo are known for abstract fashion that is perhaps some of the most avant-garde, always pushing the discussions around a garment's role on a body. A great example of this is in 1997, this incredible dress, Body Meets Dress, Dress Meets Body, that I found an example of on an auction site. And I'm actually going to give you one of my favorite hacks right now. When you want to analyze a garment that is older and is rare, try to find people who are trying to sell the item on auction because they always take the best detail photos and you can screenshot them and save them for later without paying the 19,000 euro price tag. That's an incredible tip. That's a great tip. I'm glad it could be helpful. (laughs) So returning to that 1997 dress from Comme de Garçons, when we look at the way the fabric drapes around the body, initially it's hard to fathom how you might accomplish that shape in two dimensions. On closer inspection, you can see similarities as to how the fabric gathers in bunches when you cut holes through a tube and then stitch them together, the hallmark of subtraction cutting. This isn't to say that this Comme de Garçon piece would be simple at all to construct. However, by learning different techniques such as subtraction pattern cutting, you can begin to build a vocabulary through which you can start to understand some of these more complicated designs. Another great example you mentioned, Tracy, was a dress by the late Isabel Toledo, which has a drawing next to it to show how each of the drape pieces are simply connected tubes at different angles that come together to create a very interesting shape on the body. That's so interesting. And it's a really great connection between how this pattern drafting technique you can use in your home sewing practice is just as relevant in some of the highest concept fashions on the runways. We are absolutely hitting our objective, Tracy. Home sewing meets high fashion every day. So we have discussed the work of several Japanese designers so far in this episode, and there are several other places that are great for beginners to help you begin to visualize three-dimensional pattern shapes in a flat pattern. TR cutting or transformational reconstruction by Shingo Sato is a form of origami pattern cutting, and it's truly incredible. And I recommend looking it up on Instagram. It's TR underscore cutting underscore school. We'll link that in the show notes. And of course, the series of the Pattern Magic books, which I'm sure you've seen, they're incredible. Um, And we'll link those in the show notes too. I really recommend checking those out as they're so inspirational, but they're probably a subject for another day. Perhaps that's a future episode idea, Tracy. Let us know, everyone. If you want another episode on three-dimensional pattern cutting and the world of 3D fabric manipulation, here's your chance to give us some feedback. Mm-hmm. I have the magic books as well, but I agree. I think that's worth an entire episode to discuss that topic. <laughs> Absolutely. 
There is so much to pattern cutting and you really, really can't beat an in-person class. But we hope this has given you a good starting place to kick off your journey into pattern making. For extra reading, listening, or viewing, we have a lot of recommendations. So many that we will link a blog post in the show notes with all the details for all of our favorite resources for Pattern Making 101. But if you had to pick, Tracy, I'm only going to give you three. What are your three favorite resources for learning how to draft a pattern? (laughs) <laughs> Only three. Um, I would say Winifred Aldrich, Helen Armstrong, and an in-person class. They would be my top three. Mm. And what about you? The same question. What are your top three essentials? I'm going to assume that everyone listening is like me and wants to get really creative <laughs> with their <laughs> learning style. So the first one I would have to say are the fashion pattern making technique books that I've mentioned, I think twice already by Antonio Donano. Again, I call Uh them my paint by numbers books for block drafting, since they start with already slightly built garments rather than a basic block. And from there, you can really get creative. Uh, My second one would actually be vintage patterns on Etsy. You can learn so much from looking at flat pattern pieces of shapes, especially from designer garments. Before fast fashion, designers used to release patterns for some of their most popular pieces. For example, that Issey Miyake coat. And even if you can't buy the pattern, I think simply seeing the shapes of the pattern pieces can be really helpful. Agreed. And then the last recommendation I would have is actually a good construction book. Um, We've already touched on Claire Schaefer in the past. So I would say the David Page coffin books, since once you have the pattern for the main pieces and your blocks, you're still going to need to learn what the pattern pieces should look like for facings, pockets, etc. And Mm -hmm. understand how to attach them to the garment. These books are really great for once you're going beyond kind of those basic pattern pieces and actually starting to construct a full garment. For example, you might want a patch pocket and it seems simple, but knowing most pockets have an extra flap of fabric at the top with interfacing for support, will take it from a design feature into a functional pattern. Absolutely. Well, what an episode. So much information. This was fantastic. Now looking to the future, our last segment, what are you working on next, Tracy? Well, over the next month, I plan on twirling a dress for an event this summer. I promise to share more of the details in the next couple of episodes, but mainly that's because I've consumed so many ideas for what I want to make and I'm still trying to finalize my vision. And that I guess, ties into the next episode very well, doesn't it? It ties in perfectly, Tracy. And is this for the ascot? Is that how you say it? Ascot dress, correct? (laughs) Yeah, that's right. That's the one. Yeah. (laughs) I'm so excited to see what that final iteration looks like. And do you want to share what the theme is for the next episode? I would be delighted. In our next episode, we will be discussing where we get inspiration for what we make. I cannot wait. And speaking of inspiration, between now and our next episode, I'm attempting to design and make my own Met Gala look inspired by Karl Lagerfeld. I have a fully drawn in all of the materials in theory, but I have a lot of embellishments that I still need to learn how to do. So I might need some opinions on what looks best. So stay tuned. I will definitely want all of your input. Oh, that sounds so amazing. I can't, cannot wait to see your progress and the final garment. Before our next episode, if you have any thoughts, ideas or questions for us, you can always find us on social media at Threaded Together Podcast. In the meantime, I'm Tracy. And I'm Rebecca. And this has been the Threaded Together Podcast. See you next time. Looking forward to our next episode in a month. Make sure you give us a thumbs up on Apple Podcast or follow us on Spotify. You can find more details on what we discussed today in the show notes below. And for more behind the scenes and regular updates, you can find us on all social channels at Threaded Together Podcast.